Hello, this is the second part of the World War I Battles uh, lecture. Um, this one we're going to take you from 1916 up through the end of the war. And just to kind of recap what's going on is uh, basically stalemate city. Uh, you have stalemates all over the Western Front. Um, there is some more movement in the Eastern Front and in some other spots, but uh, for us we've been concentrating our time on the Western Front. And there's really no way to break through for either side. You have the Germans on one side, then you have the French and the British on the other. Uh, for today's class, we're going to start by looking at the Zimmerman telegram. This is an image of the actual telegram uh, from Germany to Mexico. And uh, you can see it's obviously encoded here. Uh, but what you're going to be doing is using the other... Uh, Zimmerman telegram that is attached to this lesson to see the decoded message and to try to figure out what it means. So what I'm looking for you to do is to read the decoded Zimmerman telegram that the British intercepted, list the three main points in your notes. And uh, I'll kind of just ask you to pause it here, go ahead and do that, and then you can come on back to the lecture when you're done. For the actual decoded portion of the Zimmerman telegram. Here's the basic idea. Uh, Germany is uh, sending a telegram to uh, its ambassador in Mexico and then asking them to pass this on to the government of Mexico, uh, where they tell Mexico their clear intention to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, which is where submarines or U-boats for Germany can attack any ship flying a flag that could possibly be helping uh, its enemies in World War I. And uh, that's the first part of this. Then the second part um, says that, listen, we want America to remain neutral. But, and this is a big but, if America does enter the war, Germany knows how upset they are with this policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. We want you, as Mexico, to start a war against the United States. And Germany's reasoning behind this is, if the United States is fighting against Mexico on its own continent, it is much less likely that they will be able to devote a lot of resources to the fighting in Europe if they do decide to enter the war. And Germany is still hoping at this point that through their war of attrition they can get the French and the British to either separate and quit individually or quit together uh, because the lo losses will just mount so high. And so that's really what they're hoping to accomplish here. The problem is the British intercept this it takes them a little while, it takes them about three months, uh, but eventually the British figure out a way to alert the United States and so that the United States will trust that the message is in fact legitimate and so the U.S. is going to then enter the war from there. In 1917, uh, I'll come back to a couple of these, but on April 6th the U.S. declares war on Germany about a month after the British give them and show them the Zimmerman telegram and then on June 25th, we see the first U.S. troops arrive in France. It's still going to take time for the United States to train a full army, to get them prepped and ready to go, to send them overseas. So it's not like all of a sudden the United States has a million people over there. It takes time for that to happen. Uh, we see the first successful heavy bomber raid, so by plane on London, of uh, on June 13th of this year. But really the big event that we want to look at is Tsar Nicholas II. Um, there's a lot of pressure on him in Russia. The people... Uh, are revolting against him openly, in some cases, in the governmental capital of Petrograd and also in Moscow, the kind of secondary business capital of Russia at the time. So Tsar Nicholas II gives up his claim to the throne, tries to put his brother in charge. That doesn't work. Basically, Russia is crumbling from the inside. That brings us to the first battle we're talking about today, the Battle of Aqaba in Jordan. Uh, if you look at the Red Sea down here, Aqaba is located just north of it in what is today present-day Jordan. And uh, the whole idea here is that the British are stationed, they have a large garrison in Egypt. They want to travel across the Sinai Peninsula and then go north to Damascus, where they would then attack the Ottoman stronghold in what is today Syria. In order to do that, they need to make sure that there aren't Ottoman troops down here in the Arabian Peninsula that could come and attack them from behind. So the Battle of Aqaba is really to ensure that the British can travel safely to Damascus to attack. And it's going to be Great Britain to some degree, a small amount, plus uh, Arab rebels against the Ottoman Empire. 
And the whole idea, again, is to help the British forces move through the Middle East to attack the Ottoman stronghold at Damascus. It's a huge victory for the rebels, and they're led by a British man na named T.E. Lawrence, Thomas Edward Lawrence, who eventually becomes known as Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, movies made about him, all good stuff. Um, he, is, he has been in the Middle East and Egypt for a long period of time, about 12 years at this point, uh, has made friends with Emir Faisal, this guy down here. And this is an actual picture of Lawrence riding a camel up there. And uh, he is really one of the big leaders and driving forces behind these men. And it's a, a big victory for them. He is also going to help in the attack of Damascus later on uh, by the rest of the British troops. Uh, he actually has his camel shot out from under him by himself. His revolver accidentally goes off. I don't know if it's his camel or not. Uh, and hits his camel in the back of the head. And he is almost crushed by his camel, but he's able to be thrown just far enough away. Other events in 1917, we have the Balfour Declaration declaring a Jewish homeland. The Bolsheviks seizing power in Russia. This is um, Vladimir Lenin. This is V.I. Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. Uh, he's right here in this picture, and he's part of that group that is seizing control in Russia. This is where we're leading to the Russian Civil War and then the eventual establishment of communism and the Soviet Union. George Clemenceau becomes prime minister of France, and the whole idea of the revolution was to get rid of the Tsar and end the war. Russia is getting crushed by this uh, war, both economically and in terms of food, so they sign a preliminary ceasefire armistice with Germany. In 1918, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, outlines his 14 points to try to make sure that nothing like this war can ever happen again. And this includes his idea of the League of Nations. It's an early precursor to the United Nations so that nations can talk out any issues and mediate those issues with all of the countries in the world involved as opposed to secret alliances, deciding to declare war, that kind of thing. On 3-3, uh, Russia signs the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. This is... Uh, the treaty that officially ends Russia's involvement in the war with Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire uh, pulling out completely, and then they'll have their own issues from within Russia to deal with moving forward. And because Germany no longer has to commit troops or resources to fight Russia, they can pull all of, that, um, all of their resources, all of their troops, over to the Western Front to go fight against France and Great Britain. And on March 21st, we see the first part of the Spring Offensive. They decide to push their numbers advantage in the hopes of, again, getting France and the United Kingdom to eventually say, enough is enough, let's look for peace. The second battle that we're talking about, this is usually looked at as the turning point of World War I. It's the Battle of Amiens, and it occurs over the course of four days in 1918 in August. Um, this is like during the Spring Offensive. Um, if we take a look at this map here, the red dotted line is um, where the battle, when the battle will occur in, in June. It's really the extension as, as far as Germany gets from their spring offensive. The blue line here, that's where the line of fighting was prior to the spring offensive. So you can really see Germany is getting closer and closer. Paris is kind of hanging out down here. Um, Germany is really making some inroads in the spring offensive. But after the Battle of Amiens, uh, we see by November of 1918, the line is pushed all the way back through France uh, and almost out of France completely. So going back to the battle, uh, it's France, Great Britain, Australia, Canada, and U.S. troops against Germany. Um, Australia and Canada, really, their troops really distinguish themselves here. Um, the leader of the Australians, in fact, gets knighted by the king as a result of how well they perform in this battle. Uh, Canada, too, they're one of the lead points on the attack. Um, they were successful. They've been successful for the last couple of months fighting against the Germans, and they use some similar tactics here, including the use of surprise. Instead of um, firing artillery shells at them constantly to try and soften them up, knowing even though they realize at this point it doesn't work, um, they actually wait until the charge begins and then start to attack with their artillery uh, to try and use the element of surprise. And they, this battle is noted for its extensive use of tanks, over 500 uh, British Empire tanks are used in this attack. Again, they're still somewhat unreliable, but they do have a big impact in terms of morale against the Germans and also just opening up lines for the infantry to go through here in trench warfare. And it's really, this battle signifies the end of trench warfare on the Western Front. The Allies score a decisive victory uh, in this counteroffensive against the Germans. And because of this, it becomes a war of mobility once again. The line keeps moving further and further away from the heart of France 
and into Germany from there. Uh, we see Ferdinand Falk. The, he becomes, uh, he, before or prior to this, he's kind of the one who outlines the whole thing. He's the supreme allied commander. So he is in charge of the troops from all of these countries and making sure that everybody is on the same page and has a common strategy um, moving forward. So again, in August, after the battle, we see that line continue to move away from France and eventually all the way to uh, this point here at the very end of the war on the 11th of November, 1918. Speaking of the end of the war, Ottoman Empire signs an armistice on October 30th. Um, bowing down to pressure, Kaiser II abdicates his throne on the 9th. Uh, he realizes that uh, he's going to get blamed for a lot of this, and the Allies are refusing to allow them, to the, them being the Germans, refusing to allow the Germans to look for peace, uh, in part because the Kaiser is still in charge. So he sees that he ends up abdicating the throne, leading eventually to the Weimar Republic. And then on November 11th, 1111, at 1111 in the morning, the official armistice is signed, ending the fighting in World War I. Uh, there's actually still some fighting that goes on for another two or three days in North Africa before the news reaches the people there. Uh, but the armistice is signed, trying to make this a momentous occasion, showing how important the end of this great war was, the war to end all wars. Uh, and then a couple of months after that, we have the Treaty of Versailles being signed leading to the Paris Peace Conference. At this Paris Peace Conference, we'll see the big three, Winston Churchill, um, or excuse me, we'll see David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, um, George Clemenceau, the Prime Minister of France, and Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, come up with the terms of surrender, etc. Um, the ideas expressed there and the uh, degree to which Germany is punished, that's going to destroy the German economy, help usher in the Great Depression, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, and provide a breeding ground for the types of thinking that allow a man like Adolf Hitler to take control in Germany. That's the end of the war, basically. We're going to hit some uh, important pieces of technology and uh, some important kind of famous -y people from World War I moving forward. We'll also deal with the Russian Civil War and the Paris Peace Conference after that. Um, that is all. Thank you.